Hey everyone, my name is Iman Chaudhry. And my name is Danielle Solish. And today you're listening to the 10th episode of Seeing Clearly, a pre clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. On today's episode, we are here interviewing Dr. Michael Nguyen. Dr. Nguyen is a fourth year ophthalmology resident at the University of Toronto. He was born and raised in Toronto and received his medical degree from McMaster University and has a strong passion in uh, medical education. More recently, he created BISCO, the virtual introductory student course in ophthalmology. This is a free and interactive online course that teaches the fundamentals of ophthalmology to medical students. He is currently serving as the president of the Council of Canadian Ophthalmology Residents. So thank you so much for coming today. No problem, guys. Excited to be here. Let's get started. Yes, let's go ahead and get started. So our first question is a pretty broad question that we tend to ask our guests, but could you just talk a little bit about your journey to ophthalmology? Yeah, sure. Uh, So for me, I never knew what ophthalmology was before I came into medical school. Um, I like for some reason thought it was from optometry, which now that I'm in ophthalmology is like completely not true at all, obviously. Uh, But uh, what, you know, I like, wanted to do ortho when I came into med school. Um, and I think early on, I was always interested in patient quality of life and like, you know, doing stuff with my hands and doing surgery. Uh, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do uh, specifically. Uh, I discovered ophthalmology quite serendipitously. I was um, very early on in uh, pre-clerkship at McMaster. We have a lot of chances to shadow. And I told this admin that I wanted to do Opto, or sorry, ortho, but she misheard me say opto. It's very easy. I just messed it up myself. And um, so she put me into an ophthalmology OR instead of ortho. And, you know, I was very like shocked when I came in there and I was like expecting to be like hammering bones and everyone was like sitting down, like very dainty little surgery. And I was like, not really sure what was going on. So that was kind of my first introduction to ophthalmology. That obviously is not the reason why I did ophthalmology. Um, I don't think I even had a very good day that day in the OR because I like the, 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 the surgeon was asking me like, you know, what's the angle of the eye? Like, what is this structure? I had like no idea what anything was. I was like, I have no idea what you're doing or where we are, like what's going on. Um, so I didn't really have a great experience, but that kind of opened my eyes to what ophthalmology uh, is. And uh, throughout pre-clerkship, I was exploring different things, kind of like urology, even like palliative care i was always interested in things that really improve patient quality of life like meaningfully i was never a very smart person so chasing uh you know sodium and potassium values for me i was not good at that i I didn't really understand honestly a lot of the the mechanisms of how the rest of the body works uh to be honest and um, i gravitated toward uh more uh, procedural specialties like ophthalmology and uh, after a while i think i just took a leap of faith and um I think ophthalmology sometimes can be quite a big leap of faith because you don't really know what it's like to be able to fully examine the eye or even to do you know procedures microsurgery um, until quite later on in the residency so it is a very big leap of faith uh, but you know now that i'm more than halfway done i am so ecstatic to be in this field and i think that um, truly the best decision i made so that's how i got into ophthalmology Thanks for sharing that. I think it's uh, it's always interesting because a lot of our guests, you know, just kind of stumble upon ophthalmology. Um, they have no idea what it is. And then they're introduced to it. And it's kind of like they're fascinated pretty quickly with the specialty. So I think it uh, speaks a lot about the specialty. And it's, it's cool to see that it's pretty common amongst uh, the guests that we speak to. Um, so, I mean, now that you're, you're in ophthalmology and you're, you're an ophthalmology resident, uh, do you mind maybe talking a little bit about what the day in the life of an ophthalmology resident looks like? Yeah, I mean, I think that changes a lot as you go through um, the program. But for me, um, I'm a PGY4 now. So in most residency programs, the, the surgical years are, tend to be the more senior years, mm-hmm. just because there's a very large learning curve, uh, you know, for the entire field, like even to examine a patient using the cell lab completely is an important skill to have, being able to do a peripheral retinal exam, being able to you know, start doing procedures at the slit lab, procedures in the minor's room, doing some lid procedures, and then slowly moving in towards the eye and <clears throat> operating inside the eye. That's all a very graduated kind of uh, curve that you need to advance through. Um, so for me right now, I'm doing surgery. So it's kind of amazing because honestly, like every day I'm basically in the OR 
Um, and you know, amazing thing about ophthalmology, at least in Toronto, we don't have any inpatients, so we're not rounding on anyone. We kind of just show up at like 7.45 to the OR. Um, we operate all day. Um, and then, you know, depending on how the rest of uh, the clinic looks, sometimes we are the senior residents for each of our sites. So we tend to go back to the clinics to help out our junior residents if they need help or, or if they don't, then we're just done at like three o'clock, three forty uh, five, four o'clock. Um, the main surgeries that we do in Toronto in fourth year is we have a longitudinal cataract program. So instead of having like four months of just like everyday cataracts, our program does cataracts for about on average two days a week for about a year and a half. So it's about 16 months of like half the week is doing cataracts and the other half is doing other subspecialty surgeries, uh, which I think is amazing because, you know, for the next almost two years, I'll just be operating cataracts every single week. So I never have long periods of time where I'm not operating, doing the main uh, bread and butter surgery for, uh, for ophthalmology. Um, yeah, so for me, it's just OR every day and it's amazing. No, yeah, that's, that's awesome. I think you like touched on a good point though, that like, it's, it's hard to tell you take a leap of faith in like a lot of these specialties because, you know, you spend two years of your medical school just in class and learning, and you have no idea what it's going to be like when you're actually out in the ward and on the field, and then you never know the next step. So yeah, but that's awesome. And it's awesome to see you're operating. So I know you spoke about operating now, but like, what kind of stuff were you doing more in like your first two years or at the beginning of your residency? And how did that kind of compare to like maybe your clerkship electives? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so in most schools, the PGY one year is an off service year. Mm -hmm. And that kind of is like a clerkship plus. That's how I thought about it. It's, you're mm -hmm. kind of like a clerk, except now you have signing privileges. You have to take call and um, you are, are responsible now. Uh, but, you know, most PGY one years are very broad. So I was doing internal medicine, you know, neurology, general pediatrics, plastics, ENT. So pretty much a lot of the things that you would do as clerks, I did as a resident in PGY1. Um, so that was kind of what we did for most of PGY1. Uh, in PGY2 in Toronto, we have, it's mainly the eMERGE clinic. So uh, you are responsible for the day pager, um, kind of every day to every other day for the entire year depending on which site you're at. And uh, you run the eMERGE clinic, so you see all the consults from the emergency room, from outside optometrists, from even other ophthalmologists that need to send the patient down to an academic center. And you're kind of the first person to see the patient. So that's a really good time to develop a lot of your core competencies in ophthalmology. You learn how to work up a patient entirely from start to finish. You kind of see all these fresh presentations um, of various eye diseases. And you often get to be the, the, the person kind of coordinating any subspecialty care that needs to be done uh, for these patients. It's a ton of learning. Uh, it's, you know, a very steep learning curve, PGY2 for ophthalmology. Uh, but honestly, I felt like it was a year I learned the most from PGY2. That was probably the year where I really, really got into um, uh, the specialty. Uh, and uh, it can be quite busy the day to day. You know, you're starting on the page at eight, so you don't finish till five and you're recording calls from like everyone, the inpatient wards from other services, the eMERGE, and like I said, outside optometrists, it kind of keeps going and going and going. You, you get really tired um, for sure. No, there's no way to sugarcoat it, um, but a ton of learning and you get to do a ton. Um, and that really helps transition into our third year of uh, ophthalmology residency, which is a, a subspecialty year. So we kind of rotate through the different subspecialties of ophthalmology cornea, glaucoma, peds, um, retina, plastics, neuro for a couple months each. And um, you get to now, instead of seeing the eMERGE side of it, you get to see the more, you know, uh, the outpatient, the more long-term follow-ups. You still get to see the fresh new consults to that subspecialty, um, but now you get to see how each subspecialty manages this part of ophthalmology. Um, a ton of learning as well, less onerous because you no longer carry the day pager. Um, but still a ton of learning. And then for our PGY four and five year, we mainly just operate every day for like two years. So it's a really sweet um, uh, transition, at least in Toronto. Well, sounds like you've had a very busy four years. Um, uh, so for a student, I guess, that's looking at you know, the timeline of four years and, and what you do throughout your ophthalmology residency, it can probably seem a bit daunting. Um, and we were talking about a little 
like about it a little bit before uh, we started recording the podcast, but you seem to maintain a work-life balance pretty well. Um, and so do you mind maybe sharing some advice on how you've maintained that work-life balance throughout your ophthalmology residency? Yeah, that's a great, um, great question. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about because I think it's so important. Um, you know, like things like self-care and work-life balance, these terms get thrown a lot, like thrown out a lot uh, mm -hmm. recently. Um, and I think it's good because it's kind of encouraging people to think about it a bit more um, because it really like you, it's hard to overstate the importance of self-care in medicine. You can't be the best version of yourself. You can't be the best doctor or the best surgeon if you are not taking care of yourself, period. And I strongly believe that. Um, I think I've always been someone that liked to uh, you know, try and keep active. Um, at Mac, people always love to chirp McMaster for med school. And, you know, it's funny because on one of my first few uh, lectures, we actually had like a two hour lecture on mindfulness meditation, which sounds hilarious. But um, and I thought it was so hokey at the time um, when I first heard it. But, you know, I was like, I'll give it a try. Like the school obviously thought it was important enough to dedicate two hours of mandatory classes towards this. So, um, you know, I started meditating using like an app on my phone. And uh, I've been actually meditating ever since. Uh, so now it's been like three years of med school, so Mac, and then now four years of residency. Seven years, I've been meditating almost every single day. Um, and it's made a huge difference in kind of my mental health and my, uh, my outlook. So that's something I strongly recommend. Um, another thing that I really prioritize is exercise. Um, even, you know, and this doesn't have to be anything rigorous. People like even walking is honestly amazing. Like getting 30 minutes to an hour of walking a day. My mom is recently diagnosed diabetic and I was so upset with her when I found out that she got type 2 diabetes um, obviously because we know what that can lead to not including diabetic retinopathy but other more important things too uh, like with her heart um, and her brain so uh, I told her that you know you, you really have to start walking uh, every single day she wasn't really active before then and now she's been walking like an hour a day and you know her A1C is below six now it's incredible just from you know walking um, and trying to just like cut back on uh, uh, so to have adopt a more healthy diet, excuse me. Uh, so exercise is super important. And I've tried to maintain really regular exercise throughout residency. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how I manage that, but I wanted to talk about the third thing. So I've talked about mindfulness meditation. I talked about exercise. And the third thing is sleep. Mm -hmm. Sleep is the, you know, like it is, people always talk about it as like the third pillar of, of health, but it is not, it's not, the, it's not a pillar. It is like the bedrock for everything else. Like, like exercise and diet are like the pillars, but like this floor is like sleep. You need to have good sleep. And that's like, it sounds like a paradox because you're like, yeah, I'm in medicine, you know, I'm on call and all these things. It's true. Yes. There are some obligations we have, especially when you're more junior and you have to do mandatory like in-house call and your sleep's going to be compromised for sure. But on days when they're not compromised, getting like seven and a half, eight hours of sleep minimum is essential for you to be your fully functioning self. There are some people who are like, you know, I can function on like four hours, five hours, six hours of sleep. No, the studies have shown that like there is like one in like 20 million people can like survive and be at their most optimum self with less than six hours of sleep. So unless you think you are one in 20 million, um, it's probably not you. And you are probably not giving yourself you know, you're not living up to your, your full potential of what you could actually be doing um, uh, with your life. And that, it's not even just about accomplishment and like excellence. It's also about just having a more stable mood and having better relationships with people you care about. Um, these, there are so many things that sleep permeates. And, um, you know, th there's a good book, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Um, he's a PhD at Harvard. And um, he wrote this very friendly book, like a uh, consumer friendly book about summarizing his research on sleep. And that book like very much changed my life. So I, I sleep a lot. Like I tend to like go to bed at like nine o'clock, to be honest, nine, nine 30, when I'm not on call, um, obviously uh, I will go to sleep at that time. And I wake up at like, you know, five thirty six, depending on how late I uh, go to sleep. But I always try to get a minimum seven and a half hours of sleep every single day that I'm not on call. And honestly, before my OR days, I try and sleep even more, like eight hours. Like last night, I got nine hours of sleep. And today I had like my best day in the OR yet. You know, I ran, I did more than half the list of cataracts today, which is the most I've ever done. I've only started operating, you know, two days a week for the last three months now. So I'm already doing, you know, half the list of my staff's cataracts. Um, I did complicated cases. 
and like my mood was good all day. I felt great. And um, I had enough energy to, afterwards to go do like an hour workout at the gym. I like doing boot camp classes. Um, and I'm still like going now. I'm like still energetic enough to try and uh, uh, record this podcast. So uh, I, I really credit a lot of that to sleep. So um, uh, those are the three things that I really believe are essential for anyone in medicine to be your optimum self. Um, and how to uh, incorporate that into your life is a bit more challenging because people prioritize different things. And I think that, you know, for a lot of people, it always ends up being that like exercise, sleep and diet are the first things to get thrown out when you get more stressed. And, you know, I'm guilty of this too, when I'm transitioning to new periods of my life, like when I started clerkship, when I started residency, when I started operating, even, you know, there are periods of time where I wasn't exercising as much, where my sleep was a little bit, um, uh, you know, uh, back uh, sidetracked, never below seven hours though, unless I'm on call. Um, but, you know, you're not in your optimum self because you're transitioning, which is understandable. But I think you just really have to think about it like, you know, those things that you're doing is going to make you even more whatever productive or more effective, whatever word you want to use in any other part of your life. Um, so I like those things to me are like, you know, really important. And I will, I will rather give up many other things before I give up sleep and exercise. My diet is not the best admittedly, but um, that's something that I'm currently trying to work on. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. We need a I think we can all learn something from your tips and tricks because honestly, like I definitely take sleep as one of the first things to go when I'm like, oh, I could use an extra hour of studying. And I know at the end of the day, and so many people will give me this pearl of wisdom. It's like the extra one hour of studying for the extra one hour of sleep. Like at that point, you should just probably go to sleep. But no, I really appreciate it. And I was also thinking as you were talking about the meditation that in our like orientation this year at the beginning of our second year, they had us all like do this box breathing and meditation. And I could tell so many students in our class were just like, you know, I'd rather go home and like not be here right now. And it's, you have to like take a step back and be like, wait, this is extremely important. And this is just like taking even five minutes to meditate or five minutes to breathe and five minutes to pause can go such a long way, especially when you're stressed and everything going on. So thank you. for. Oh yeah, that. absolutely. I, I, it's really hard to, you know, when I was like, uh, like, when I was more a few years ago, when I was um, really not really into meditation, but I I was I, I would try to uh, you know encourage people to meditate more, um, and you know I've kind of backed off a bit because I think that as much as you want to try to promote this amazing thing, you know it sometimes takes people to kind of discover it for themselves. So I don't really try and push it onto people. I don't want to be that type of person, but it is honestly one of the most important parts of my life mm -hmm. and that and sleep and exercise uh, that really uh, helped me stay balanced. And it's, it's ironic because it's like all these things take time, right? And people are talking about like time management and you're like, well, how can you sleep eight to nine hours a day and meditate for 10 minutes and also exercise for an hour? Like, where do you find this time? And it's like, well, you know, I make the time to do those things so that when like for the rest of my day, I can be more effective in my day and not just, you know, my like scroll through Instagram for like 20 minutes or like do whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not saying that people don't need to do that sometimes to de-stress. Um, but I think that evidence has shown that there's better ways of de-stressing. Um, and, um, you know, I try and look at it a lot through evidence too, you know, where in medicine, we should try to look at what research and evidence shows us. And those things are the most effective ways to just be a better person um, in any metric that you want to measure. Sleeping, exercising, and meditation will improve like your life vastly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want this to become like a self-help podcast, but uh, uh, this is something I'm very passionate about. And I think that in another world, I would have been like a lifestyle medicine doctor uh, um, because like it's just incredible, mm -hmm. uh, really. I'm kind of sad that ophthalmology has less lifestyle risk factors that you can modify. It's pretty much smoking, like don't smoke because that leads to all the badness. Uh, for us uh, but things like diet and exercise aren't really things that we counsel our patients on but sometimes I wish it was so that I can tell them more about this um, but anyways no no for, no I, I completely agree with everything that you're saying it's there's definitely you need to carve time for the things that are extremely important especially when it's such a long journey and you need to like maintain stamina maintain the excitement like throughout that entire process it's extremely important so thank you 
Um, and like you said, almost everything we learn in class and school, it's like you pause and you think about things that can help your patient and almost every list for every possible disease disorder, it's like exercise, sleep, like and those are the top, like could be more effective than any specific medication for that specific illness. So it's very true. Um, okay, but now we can change gears a little bit. So this is actually the last question that we have for you today in terms of academics before we go to our would you rather segment. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your involvement with COSIG and the summer VSCO course that you ran last summer. Sure. So for those who are listening who don't know, uh, COSIG is the Canadian Ophthalmology Student Interest Group. It's a, you know, a group that was formed last year by a group of medical students who wanted to help um, increase exposure to ophthalmology and uh, across all the schools uh, in Canada, uh, all 15, 16 schools in Canada. Um, and I got involved as the resident mentor for um, resident advisor for that group. And one of the projects that I, one of the, the projects that I worked on last year that I was very proud of is something called the VSCO, which is uh, the Virtual Introductory Student Course in Ophthalmology. Um, and uh, that course really was inspired by something called TORIC, which is another funny and clever cataract surgery acronym, uh, which stands for the Toronto Ophthalmology Residency Introductory Course. There are so many acronyms in ophthalmology, my goodness. TORIC, that is a course that all PGY1 residents in ophthalmology attend in person in Toronto at the end of PGY1. It's like an amazing like six week party, super great. You get to learn a ton from a lot of faculty from Toronto and you know visiting from other schools. Um, uh, you get to meet the rest of your cohort. There's like 40 residents-ish per year excuse me, across the country. And um, it's just so much fun. Like some of my best friends I've met during the tour. Like, I even invited, like I had, I recently got married like on a mountain uh, and we took helicopters up <laughs> to the mountain in, in Alberta. We went, we were in Banff and we took some mountains up, uh, some helicopters up to the mountain. So we had three helicopters and we only fit like 14, 15 people. And one of those people I picked was like this guy I met on tour. And, you know, we, we, we were like, we never really like interacted more than Toric and like whenever we would visit each other, uh, we would stay with each other. But even then, you know, it just shows that you meet a lot of your lifelong friends there for sure. Um, and that course, uh, you know, it's like every day, it was like a lot of introductory learning for residents. And I wanted to, to create something for medical students because I remember when I was a medical student, there was like none of this. It was all like all the like the resources I got were from mentors that I was lucky enough to have. Um, at, at McMaster because there was, you know, an ophthalmology program and people were very friendly. Um, um, but there was no unified source that was like specifically for uh, medical students interested in ophthalmology. You know, there's always the like medical students in general who should know this much about ophthalmology, but I found that was very basic. And then there was like resident level material, which is like far too advanced for what uh, it needs to be for, you know, a third year, fourth year ophthalmology uh, medical student, interested medical students. So I wanted to uh, create this course and, you know, uh, COVID really has made um, virtual learning, Zoom very much uh, for better or worse, a part of our lives. So I thought I'd try to harness the good parts of it to connect people from all over Canada. Uh, and, you know, we ended up having a ton of people participate. We had a six week course, there was 10 workshops. And uh, they're all still available for um, viewing if you want. We can have a link in the description. Um, and, uh, you know, these videos were by instructors and speakers that I personally have had taught me or I've seen teach. So I know these are people that are good at teaching. So it's not just random people that we kind of collected. We actually try to get people that are interested or excited about medical education, specifically for medical students. And then we wanted the course to be engaging. We had like gift card prizes. Like I, we tried to be very innovative and we had a lot of a uh, cahoots uh, participation during the uh, lectures. So everything was very um, engaging and interactive. And I think we had like over 300 people, like unique people attend from all over Canada and the US and uh, even random other countries in the world. Um, so it was kind of incredible to see so many people attend and had quite good receptive uh, reception. Uh, so we're very excited to continue that on again this year. Um, yeah, so that was kind of my, uh, that was kind of born from my own 
dissatisfaction with the state of medical education for medical students in ophthalmology who actually were interested in it. And I wanted to help create something with the help of uh, some really excellent medical students like yourselves um, uh, to help create Visco. <clears throat> Congratulations on uh, you know creating Visco and and the success of the program over the summer. Um, we'll definitely include the link to the videos uh, in uh, in our description of the podcast, and uh, and I definitely encourage our listeners to check it out. There's some great videos, um, like you said. I mean, for better or for worse. Uh, online medical education is kind of probably here to stay. And so that's where you came up with Visco. That's how we kind of came up with iCurriculum. It's uh, it's online resources. I mean, you can never really replace in-person learning, but you can definitely use it to supplement, um, you know, all of the in-person learning you get in medical school. And I'd highly encourage uh, people to use the Visco resources as well. Um, so thank you again for that. So like Danielle said, that was kind of the last question um, related to ophthalmology stuff uh, for our listeners um, that are that have been listening to other episodes. You know that we move into a more uh, personal segment of the episode. So we're going to move on to the would you rather section. Um, so I'll kind of just jump right into it with the first uh, would you rather for you. So uh, would you rather never be able to listen to music again or never be able to see a movie again? Hmm. So it's funny because I'm actually not a really big movie fan or music fan. Um, I think, <laughs> uh, like, I love music. Don't get me wrong. Like, I love music. I love, like, work, like when I work out, you know, I love blasting music. It always puts me in a good mood. But I never really, like, listen to music otherwise when I'm, like, if I had time to do something, I wouldn't choose to listen to music. I would, you know, choose to do something else. And for movies, it's kind of like if I want to see something, then I'll see it. But I'm by no means a big movie buff. Like I, I swear I haven't seen like, like half the Disney movies. I don't know, like a lot of the, the more classic movies either. So which one would I rather never do again? I think it would have to be movies because I think music still is a very, like I still love music, like, but I, um, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> okay, I have a follow-up question to this. Yes. Uh, so if you're walking or you're driving and you're alone, and you're yeah. listening to something or maybe you're not but are you listening to something are you listening to like a podcast instead are you calling someone like what are you doing if you're not listening to music hmm so i think a reason why i don't listen to a lot of things is my oh i i don't like commuting mm -hmm. that is one of the few things in life that i really 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 do not enjoy mm -hmm. um doing um and it's funny there are you know humans are very adaptable uh, you know, people are able to adapt to kind of horrendous situations in their lives based on their environments and where they're born, etc. And I'm not discounting that, of course. Um, but, you know, it's true that people are very adaptable. But it's funny because studies have shown that the, the, one of the few things that humans are not adaptable is commuting. That is one of the things. And the second thing is variable noise, like variable noise levels, kind of like city traffic um, that is kind of uh, not predictable. Um, those two things, humans are very bad bad as, um, at uh, kind of adapting to. Mm. And I really hate commuting. Like if I have to commute more than like a 10 minute bike ride or equivalent, like a 20 minute walk, I am in such a bad mood. Like, <laughs> you know, I really, really do not enjoy it at all. So I, like, obviously that's gonna factor into where I practice in the future because if I need to like drive for more than 15, like 20 minutes max, I can't do it. I just cannot do it. Like I am in such a bad mood. Um, from especially if it's like a really traffic route, like if it's a long drive with no traffic, it's probably okay. Uh, what am I listening to? Um, you know, yeah, like I like have moods. Sometimes I listen to audiobooks. Sometimes I listen to podcasts. I don't listen to anything uh, really religiously. Um, for podcasts, I enjoy um, listening to like uh, there's like a, a rational reminder. It's about finances. That's like one of my other interests. Um, and uh, what other podcast eyes for ears is a good one for residents it's a kind of a uh, review of uh, uh, content for our board exams not a good recommendation for medical students most of them some of them are okay for med students most of them are like so rare like lymphohistiocytic something i don't even know what the term is like insanity stuff like you'll never see uh, but get tested um i listen to audiobooks i think some uh like i'm recently like getting back into fantasy 
but I'm more so reading those books. I was like super into it as a kid. And then, you know, like life happens, undergrad, med school, residency. And then recently I'm just like, yeah, why not? So I got myself like an e-reader. It's like sitting on my bedside table. It's trying to help with my sleep routine, which, you know, I'm very passionate about uh, making a very nice sleep routine for myself. Um, so yeah, but usually I don't listen to too much. I kind of just not saying that I meditate, but you know, I kind of just sit and reflect on my day and things, but yeah, not really listening to too much music. So another follow-up question. You don't <laughs> like, like commuting longer than 15 to 20 minutes. How have you, uh, been getting around in Toronto or <laughs> yeah, T Toronto is so our residency is sweet. I don't have a car. It's amazing in Toronto. Um, you know, we live, there's five academic hospitals that we rotate through. Uh, four of them are uh, within a 15 minute bike ride from where I live. Mm. Um, and the fifth one, I'm only there like two months a year. I just finished my rotation. It's at Sunnybrook. That's the one that's slightly further away. It's kind of like a 20 minute. No, that's not true. It's a 15 minute Uber in, with no traffic or a 40 minute TDC ride quite painful um so i only need to endure that for two months it's a great place i love being there excellent hospital like fantastic uh learning uh, center but really just so far away from me um and i know i'm like you know like people in the gta commute for like an hour to come to work so i know that i'm like i can sound very uh spoiled when i say that i can endure more than a 15 minute bike ride but you know that's just me and that's uh, like one thing that i like really feel strongly about um so yeah if you come to toronto you don't need a car because i don't have a car and i've gone through almost all of residency just fine well that's awesome to know and it's nice that everything has been pretty close to where you are i'm sure that makes it convenient which is kind of on the lines of my next would you rather question so my next would you rather question is would you rather be 30 minutes early for, for everything you do or 10 minutes late for everything you do Oh, 30 minutes early for sure. That is like an easy answer. Um, I, I think in, <laughs> this is some advice for medical students out there. Um, you know, people, when you start like pre clerkship and then like, you know, like your senior clerks come or like residents or even staff come and then you're asking like, how do I be a good clerk? Like, and people are always like, you know, just be a nice person and like show up early. And you're like, oh, like, that's so obvious. Like, tell me something, like, tell me something like good. Like, why are you saying such a boring thing? But like, honestly, those two things are just like the most fundamental things. Whenever I remember some of the best med students I've had, they were all nice. They were all early for everything. That is like a universal. Um, like, it really cannot be overstated how important it is to be early for things in medicine especially the more junior you are because if you're a med student and your only job is to be nice and show up early and you can't even do that it is like very like in people's mind people are like wow michael like this guy showed up 10 minutes late he was holding a coffee and a croissant like <laughs> Like, come on, what are you doing? And like, people never, never let that go. The people really just like, do not let that go. Cause they're just like, huh, like really, like you can't even be early. So for sure, I'll be 30 minutes early for everything. I try to be like 10 minutes early for anything anyways. And like, I'm like a senior resident now and I still show up like 30 minutes early for the OR um, to get everything set up. Uh, I think that's an easy, easy, easy question. Yeah, I was just going to say, as like a student in clerkship, the only answer should probably be third, whatever the earlier option is. Yeah. yeah, you go, you can like hang out for a bit. There's no worries. Exactly. It's the first impression you're making on someone is when you show up there. So it's true. And especially if you're like a, a clerk and you're like going to a new place, you have no idea where you're going. You like don't you need, like, need to go to the washroom you have no idea where the washroom is and then you're like oh crap like i want to go to the washroom but then i don't know where the, the, the like the meeting room is you're so stressed and like there's like a ward and like it's, the hospitals are a huge mess yeah i would just go early for everything that is one of the best things you can do to set yourself up for success for sure 100 percent. and i think a lot of our uh, of our guests have given the same advice is be nice and show up early so definitely a great would you rather question <laughs> um so with all of that i just want to say thank you so much for uh being with us and for filming this episode uh with us uh, i definitely enjoyed my uh my time chatting with you and i'm sure our, our audience also uh will uh, enjoy the episode and so to our audience thank you so much for listening to this episode of seeing clearly again this is our pre-clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology 
uh, to stay caught up with everything else iCurriculum is doing, be sure to check out our website, iCurriculum.com, and follow us on Instagram at iCurriculum. Uh, thank you again for, uh, for being here with us and for listening to the episode. Thank you.